Good. I called this module motor control, but uh, it should be really kinematic, uh, kinetics and elements of control. But I would first want to clarify that term, uh, motor control as a term. It's, it's used more in the domain of human and biological motion. Um, and you know, I don't mean, if you, you know, like daily life English might sound strange, motor is like that th thing, like in the car, right? Um, so in, in the human motor control, people really use that term to talk about how to actually bring about a movement, physically make a arm or some actuator move. And bring about a movement means physics, right? Mechanics that is really getting the mechanical degrees of freedom to change velocity. And that means forces, right? And that's what classical, the dynamics of mechanical systems are. And we sometimes call that now kinetics. Uh, in the context of human movement. Uh, on the other hand, so, so that means that you have to generate forces, right? And that's what actuators are about. And then it quickly turns out that that requires some measure of control. I'll clarify that what that is. So something that makes sure that the mechanical action corresponds to what you're trying to do, what you're planning, what you're intending. For instance, the time trajectory that we just talked about last week, how that is approximated by the actual mechanical action. So that's uh, the area that is called motor control. A lot of uh, work in human uh, movement science is about motor control that is you know, dealing with forces and feedback and things like that. And they will give you an impression of that next week. In the robotic domain, people don't really use that term as much. They talk more about the dynamics of arms, or robot mechanical dynamics or kinetics, and then control. <laughs> uh, these books that I mentioned earlier um, contain chapters on control, especially this uh, more accessible second book here has a good chapter. Now I'll actually quote from some of that. And I, as I pointed out earlier and so on earlier slides, there are um, online versions available of both of these books. So it's, if you want to go deeper into that, that's a very good resource. Okay, so let's just think about mechanical dynamics. So this is essentially Newton, right? Um, the dynamics of masses moving. You're all familiar with that from high school, I suppose. And some of you have had maybe courses on that at the university. So if you have a mechanical mass, a point mass, let's say, you can characterize its position by some variable X, which would be a 3D vector if it's in, um, in 3D space. Um, and that variable, that will be describing the position of that uh, mass in an inertial frame. In fact, you could define an inertial frame as the one in which these kind of equations are true. Uh, so in, uh, on a description like that, uh, Newton's law says that the acceleration, the second derivative of the position times the mass would be equal to the force. You can actually um, also use that to define what force is, which is almost circular. Um, the law, the inertial frame is the one in, in which, in the absence of any forces, uh, the right-hand side is zero. So the, uh, the, when the acceleration is zero, that means that the velocity doesn't change. That's the law of inertia, that the velocity doesn't change. And uh, you know this becomes a meaningful equation if you have other recipes of how to measure force. And traditionally, the for measurement of force was related to Hooke's law, having some kind of calibration of force uh, in which you can uh, use some deformation of a material like a spring to measure force. And only then can you actually make sense of this equation. So that's sort of the physics background, right? Now, um, inertial frames are the ones and velocities are, remain unchanged. And uh, in uh, robotic motion, we'll deal with a lot of non-inertial frames, namely rotating joints, arms, that are um, so they, they uh, are accelerating frames, right? And in the rotating frame, you're accelerating, and you can see that if you didn't attach um, the robot arm to the joint, it would fly off, right? From what we call centrifugal force, is sort of a, an apparent force, is sort of a um, naive physics description. And in uh, robotics, we talk, talk about its inverse, the centripetal force that keeps uh, the rotating arm on its um, circular trajectory. Um, 
So I think you all have an intuition for that, right? If you rotate around your long axis, you know, like spin, then uh, there's an outside force, that the centrifugal force that um, would tend to accelerate your, you know, anything that you have on, on you, like maybe your jacket flies out or something like that, right? Uh, that would be, uh, re reflect that Newton's law um, doesn't, uh, uh, is not valid in that frame that there are apparent forces that means that the trajectories follow more complex trajectories and one can write down uh, equations of motion that uh, correctly incorporate these um, apparent forces when you describe the motion in non-inertial frames and I'll derive the Lagrange framework for that for, for dealing with that in a moment. The other force is a little bit more subtle, the Coriolis force. Maybe you remember in high school that there was something about that. And there was this famous pendulum for Coe's pendulum, where um, by, by observing a, a, a free hanging pendulum um, and its position, you can see that um, the surface of the earth in which this pendulum uh, is uh, to which it is attached um, is not actually an inertial frame because the earth is rotating and the rotating frame you have these non-inertial forces um, and this is a pendulum that is you know, vertical to the earth's surface so centrifugal or centripetal forces which are um, uh, well actually it's a bit more subtle than that it, you know at, at least at the equator are vertical to the surface, those um, can be excluded. And still, you have this uh, position. So the, that's the Coriolis force that you're seeing there. Intuitive um, notion of the Coriolis force is thinking of a carousel, you know, like a children's carousel. Let's think of one where there is no nothing built on. It's just a flat surface. And now, let's say you're shooting a ball across that carousel, right, in a way that the ball just rolls free of friction let's say then it's obvious that from the point of view of an external observer the ball is in an uh, inertial frame if it doesn't you know have any interaction with the carousel and so it would go in a straight line in the outer frame across that carousel if you're sitting on the carousel and you're observing the uh, ball's trajectory in carousel coordinates then that straight uh, line in outer space would correspond to a curved trajectory on the carousel, right? As the ball moves straight, you're, you're rotating with the carousel and you're seeing the ball uh, from different positions. And uh, in your uh, frame, it looks like a curved um, trajectory. And so the mathematical description of the motion in that accelerating frame, the rotating frame of the carousel, has to have an additional force and then that explains why the trajectories are curved. So these are apparent uh, forces in the sense they are they show up when you describe the motion in a non-inertial frame. If you were to transform the uh, mathematical description into an inertial frame, then they would go away. I, this I assume you all know, I'm just sort of alluding to that. Please interrupt me if you, if you have uh, questions about that. Now, um, um, for some reason, I can't see my chat dialogue. <clears throat> so uh, now in, in robots, we're of course not talking about free point masses, as you learn in high school, uh, we're talking about rigid bodies. So these are uh, you know, taken as pieces of matter that are not deformable, uh, you know, these ridges, so that we can describe them by the six degrees of freedom that um, such finite masses have. These are the three translational degrees of freedom and the three rotational degrees of freedom that we talked about in the lecture on kinematics. Uh, so mathematically speaking, if you have a, a rigid body like that, let's say one of these two se segments here, you would describe it by six coordinates. I'm writing this in some abstract sense and you would uh, posit a, a Newton's law for those. Uh, this is the uh, no notation we use in the um, translational degrees of freedom, where this would be a Cartesian coordinate, and this would be the masses of the force. And if you included 
a rotational degrees of freedom, then you would have, um, for instance, um, particular angles, Euler angles that you characterize to characterize the orientation of the segment. And then these would be the inertial moments, and these would be any uh, uh, kind of um, torques that are applied to that uh, uh, segment. So these would be, um, for these two segments, you would have um, 12 variables, six for every uh, segment, right? Um, if these two are connected uh, as uh, with, with functions hinge joint, so this would be hinge joint and that will be hinge joint. I'm assuming it's connected to something that's connected to the, to the ground. It's the, the, this joint is connected to the earth or to, the, to a table that's fixed in the earth. Then you see there is um, a dramatic reduction in degrees of freedom. We discussed that under kinetics, um, uh, kinematics, where you would say the, the only motion of this segment is possible motion is rotation around this axis that's thought to go through vertical to the plane of the drawing. And um, that will be just one degree of freedom for that whole segment. And then the segment again can only rotate around the axis that goes through the the drawing plane uh, vertically here. And at this occasion, they have two degrees of freedom out of these 12. So a dramatic reduction of degrees of freedom. And so that's going to be the challenge of how to write down the equation of motion of these uh, kind of segments when you have um, such constraints that reflect the, the uh, constraints of, um, of these you know, uh, kinematic chains. Um, and this problem is dramatically simplified by the notion of generalized uh, coordinates that's the Lagrangian framework. So you will not see um, kinematic, uh, the kinetics of robotics ever described in Newtonian terms. It's always using uh, the Lagrange framework because of these constraints uh, of the, of the uh, kinematic chains. Uh, in physics, more often you will see Hamiltonian descriptions, which are um, is a different form of description of mechanics that lends itself um, to descriptions where there are force fields that uh, are applied. So for instance, if you think of particles in gravitational fields uh, or charged particles in electrical fields and so on evolving, then you can use this Hamiltonian framework, which happens to be the framework that generalizes nicely to, um, to quantum mechanics. So, so some of you might be familiar with that, with the Hamiltonian, it's on the energy function. The Lagrange formulation, I'm not sure if that is so commonly taught in physics these days, but it is um, the preferred uh, description of uh, mechanics for systems with constraints, and that's what robotic arms are. So roughly you have Newtonian, sort of the simple, naive, historically uh, useful description, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian, and we're using the Lagrangian framework here. So in the Lagrangian framework, you introduce constraints. Uh, first, you introduce generalized coordinates. So these Qs are generalized coordinates. And that means that you're just using any kinematic description, any kind of parameter that uh, spans the configuration of your mechanical system. So here, these joint angles are such candidates. You could use other descriptions. Um, for instance, you could use the horizontal projection of the length of the segment or similar here. Uh, but these might not be particularly convenient. They, they might have singularities, for instance, where the description um, isn't differentiable. The connection of the description to the uh, true physical variables is not differentiable. That will be awkward. Um, so generalized coordinates, you would just have two generalized coordinates. Um, and then the idea would be that given these generalized coordinates, like giving these two joint angles, you should be able to compute all uh, mechanical um, variables, so all positions and orientations of these segments. It's quite intuitive. If you know these two joint angles, you could uh, uh, characterize the position of the two segments and their orientation in space in full generality, uh, to, which means also fixing the coordinate frames so or knowing that this segment is actually anchored here in, let's say, the origin of the coordinate frame x, y. You'd, you'd have to, you know, the length of these segments would be parameters that enter that constraint equation. Uh, mathematically, the, that means that the constraint equations that you have that reduce the degrees of freedom, this would be the equations that characterize these hinge joints as constraints between different variables, are equivalent to the equations that determine all the degrees of freedom from your generalized coordinates. Um, 
not something that you, you have to worry about. You know, this is all pre-processed for the robotic literature, this sort of 19th century mathematics, which is all very well understood. Now, to with, with these generalized coordinates, we can um, derive equations of motion very elegantly and directly from the so-called Lagrange function. Um, and I'll just take that as an axiom. This is something now from physics that we just in, uh, import. So I'm not justifying why that is the case. Um, the Lagrange function is this, so let's formulate that very concretely here for the kinds of uh, situations that arise in robotic manipulators. And for these purposes, the Lagrange function is really just the kinetic minus the potential energy. Now, while the Hamiltonian, some of you might know, is the kinetic plus the potential energy, is total energy. But the Lagrange function is that difference sort of expresses some kind of the trade-offs between these two. And uh, the famous discovery in the 19th century was that the equations of motion of uh, rigid bodies with constraints can be derived from the so-called least action principle, that is from the idea that the integral in time over this Lagrangian, that is over this difference between kinetic and velocity, uh, potential energy um, is minimal. That's called the action, that integral, and it being minimal means its variation is zero. So, so the, the thing under the integral is called the action. And to minimize the action, you say, if I vary, the trajectory of the trajectories, this delta Q is, is, is a, an idea that you're varying the entire time course of these uh, trajectories, X, uh, Q of T, that then um, the uh, true trajectories will be the ones where the uh, this integral is minimal. So the variation with the, when, when you look at a minimum, that means that as you vary the trajectories, um, this variation, will be zero at the minimum, right? I mean, minimum as derivative zero. So this is the generalization of a derivative to function space. It's called variation. I'll not explain the mathematical grounding of that in a lot of detail, but we can go through a little computation um, to derive the Lagrange equation from this. And maybe that helps to not be totally puzzled by the, the functional form of that. And then I'll just illustrate that it is useful that uh, doing that you uh, really find equation of motion that makes sense. So here's a little derivation of this equation. It's called the Euler-Lagrange equation. It's a general principle of how you derive uh, equations of motion for uh, systems with constraints. You can do this also in other contexts. So the variation of this action um, behave sort of like a derivative, like a partial derivative. So you can use um, the chain rule. So here the integral depends on both the uh, time course of the uh, generalized coordinate, Q of T, and its derivative, Q dot of T. Kinetic energy depends on Q dot, right? And so you have Q and Q dot in there. And so <clears throat> this dependence can be expressed by taking the, der the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Q and then multiplying with you know, the variation of Q plus the derivative of L with respect to Q dot and the variation along Q dot. You can put this variation under the integral, it's linear operation. And, um, and what you then have is that that integral has to be zero. That will be the variation of the action. So it's like a, a chain rule for derivatives, right? Where Q dot is the idea that's the time derivative of the variation, right? Um, and if you have that, then you could think of this, again, in terms of partial dif differentials, you can think of this as something that you do a partial integration on. Now I'm assuming that you remember what partial integration is. Uh, it's sort of based on the idea that if you have a, an integral of a two functions, let's say f and g, um, that you know by uh, the product rule that let's say f dot times g plus g dot times f is the derivative of f times g. So that is d by dt of the product f by g. So if you integrate over that, then the total derivative fg that just gives you the product of these two functions f and g at the boundaries of the integral. 
And on the right-hand side, you have the integral you know, f dot g and the integral f g dot. And so you can do that with respect to this. So here is uh, you know, the derivative, um, the, the, the dot. And so you want to put that dot on to the other part here. That's what happens here. And the d, d by dt of this term, right? That's putting the dot on the other side. Um, and so the sum of those is equal to the, the uh, term when the dot is removed. And this is when the dot is removed, right? When you have this and the dot removed here, you evaluate this term at the boundaries of the integral. And then the other term that you will have to have added here to the right, but because you don't have it, you add it on the left, uh, subtract it on the left. That will be when you move the dot to the other term. So you put the dot here and the dq is on the right. Uh, so now uh, it's this term together with these two makes this partial integration. This term here just stays, right? And it's just the same here. We put uh, the dq here on the outside. And so, so that's just mathematical transformation, right? Partial integration. And so now you recognize that the variation of any of these trajectories um, is zero at the boundaries because the variation principle says, you know, I'm looking at all possible paths of uh, my kinematic variables that um, go from a start to an end time and start and end position. And I'm varying them, but I'm keeping fixed at start and end position because that's what the equation motion is about that from a given start and end value, which trajectory do you have? Well, the one that minimizes action. So this term is zero and therefore you have, are left with this term here. And this is any arbitrary variation of the trajectory. So uh, for, for an arbitrary variation of this trajectory this you know, to be zero, this whole thing here has to be zero. The, no, function in front of that variation has to be zero. And that's the Lagrange equation. And so this is the equation of motion of, um, of a mechanical system, a conservative mechanical system, um, you know, can be derived that way. And you will see in a moment that's very powerful because we can easily write down the kinetic energy of a complex robotic arm as a function of its position velocities. And we can also write down the potential energies, which is just a gravitational term, right? Um, in, in these terms, and then we can derive the equation of motion just by computing these derivatives. And you'll see that's very easy. It would be much, much harder to take uh, Newt's equations and you know, uh, eliminate variables to keep track of these constraints on the joint. Um, axes and so on, and derive the equation from there. Now, unfortunately, to make things a little more ugly, we're usually using it in, in a slightly different form where we add so-called um, uh, generalized external forces to this. So, so not zero, but some external forces here, because we're going to apply the strobot arms where there are motors, torque motors. Um, and the meaning of these really depends on the generalized coordinates you're going to uh, use. So that, that's something, the physical meaning of which you have to figure out. And we're going to use joint angles. And if we do this right with joint angles, this will turn out to be torques that apply to these, uh, at these joints. Um, and so that's what we will typically be uh, looking at. <clears throat> now a word about these dynamical systems before we go into the details, I'll show you now some examples. <clears throat> so these are the dynamics that describe the generalization of Newton's laws to rigid bodies that have these kind of constraints, right? And um, before I added these strange external forces here, this here, this is a conservative system. <clears throat> it is <clears throat> Newton's law. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. No external, no forces, no external forces. And um, that's a conservative system that is the energy of the system does not change in time. It's actually very fundamental physics related to the fact that the, the absolute time doesn't matter. Whenever you, the, well, however you <clears throat> describe time, you can translate time. It's actually very general, it's kind of you know, interesting. <clears throat> now, uh, energy conservation, right? You're very familiar with that. That's one of the best laws of nature. We've tested it in millions of, variations and it's always to turn out to be correct. Um, so it's just the law of nature. We just postulate that. 
And so these systems respect that. And that's where the minimum action principle actually comes from. Now, the uh, conservation of energy um, makes this a very special class of dynamical systems. And that's quite different. It's kind of orthogonal to the kind of dynamical systems we've used earlier for planning and motion planning. And it will, it's also, we'll show up in a little moment when we use control. Uh, and just this just a little perspective I want to give you on, on, on this. <clears throat> so in the dynamics that we've been talking about at the level of planning, we talked about tractors, right? And tractors would make sure that you're converging to the same solution independent of your initial state so that you fulfill constraints <clears throat> by just putting the attractors into the right places which respect the, the constraints. Attractors, um, Intuitively speaking, certainly are not conserved systems. They, they are some kind of friction idea, right? That for instance, if you think of the attractor as being a minimum of some potential, then you would be you know, going to that minimum and stay there. So if you think of the initial uh, position as um, you know, some, uh, having some potential energy, then you come to rest when that potential energy is less. So your total energy has gone from some finite initial value to zero at the end, no kinetic energy and let's say the minimum potential energy. Uh, so <clears throat> if you think of a, a ball rolling in some landscape, uh, a ball that has no friction would ever not step at the minimum, would just keep back up. In fact, it would start oscillating between, uh, let's say two sides of the potential uh, minimum potential well uh, that have equivalent potential energy would oscillate forever because it wouldn't have any damping. So these attractor notions essentially imply that there is some kind of damping in that system that eats away the energy so you stay in that state. This can be, mathematically, uh, can be made mathematically abstract, um, exact. Um, it's runs under the label of Liouville's principle. Not sure anybody knows that. And so Leoville's principle says that if you take an energy conserving mechanical system and you look at a certain set of initial condition that has a volume, let's say in 3D space, in 1D space would be the length of an initial interval with which you start, then that volume is preserved over time. So when you look at any time later, the, it might, you know, the, the uh, different initial conditions would now you know, have been moved all over the place. But if you look at the size of that set, even though it might be deformed, the volume in the appropriate dimension would be the same, unchanged. And uh, that is not compatible, compatible with having an attractor, right? And, uh, it's certainly not a point attractor. Uh, because in a point attractor, you would say, I have an initial um, a set of initial conditions and they all converge to the same attractor. So if you think of that initial set, let's say to be an interval, then the length of the interval would shrink over time to zero. That would be the conversions. So attractor systems cannot satisfy Liouville theorems, and um, and by because the Liouville uh, theorem is true for conservative systems, they don't have attractors. So it's a very different kind of dynamical system that shows up in um, in, in practical things. That is, if you numerically simulate these kind of systems as you will actually have to do when you uh, run a lot of the control schemes I'll be looking at. You have to numerically solve these equations to make predictions. Um, these equations are not as robustly numerically uh, simulatable as the attract dynamics we looked at. Um, the attract dynamics are very forgiving because of this conversion. So if you make a little mistake, that means that the state that you're uh, that you're actually representing in your algorithm isn't exactly the state that you're having. It's a little bit offset by some rounding error or approximation error. But um, you could think of this as like a little perturbation of your true state. And the attract dynamics will compensate for that, right? It will still converge to the attractor. So even if you keep inserting this kind of numerical error, the dynamics itself will compensate for that. And we've made use in a lot of our attract dynamics approaches, and we do that also for neural, neural networks, as you know, in the winter semester, I'm teaching about that. Uh, by having attractor dynamics, we make the numerics very simple. When you have a conservative system, there are no attractor states, right? And, and that means they're not as forgiving. So um, they keep track of these errors. So if you introduce a little error that, 
that um, the effect of that error will be felt. Uh, it, it will not go away. And that really means uh, very concretely that you have to use better numerics. You have to be more precise. And over time, the approximation that uh, your numerical algorithm uh, performs will degrade. And that is a real practical concern for how to do control, for real-time computing on control, because uh, the algorithms you have to use and the hardware that's, uh, that can support them has to be quite good to make the computations precise enough to actually achieve some of the control schemes we'll be looking at. Now, the control schemes will actually introduce dissipation and, and attractor dynamics. So they, they make it a little bit better but uh, still there's underlying problem because the, the estimation of what the physical dynamics does uh, has to be good enough for these control schemes to work well. So that's just a little bit of background. So even though it's also just a differential equation, as you'll see, it's a different category of differential equations and it really has different practical implications uh, that we have that. Now, when we have external forces, there is no energy conversation per se, because these forces actually insert energy. If you have a torque engine, right, you can actuate a, a joint that was resting and now make it move, costing energy. Um, so it violates uh, Leoville's principle, but it doesn't necessarily violate it in a good way. For instance, it can lead to even you know, more instability because you know, your joint could be growing. Maybe uh, as you have a little deviation, the, the future joint that you uh, torque that you will generate might even grow. So no guarantee that it's going to converge. I wanted to illustrate this abstract uh, principle by taking you through a few examples. Now, I'm, I can't really make all the derivations in detail. That would be also just you know, a different kind of lecture, but maybe make it plausible to you. So here's some you know, textbook example, this, uh, the, the 3D pendulum that is you have a pendulum hanging from the ceiling. That would be your uh, you know, the Foucault pendulum that you can use to measure Coriolis forces. So it hangs from the ceiling. Uh, is a, we approximate it as the point mass. Um, so it, it's on a, you know, an, oops, sorry. A, uh, let's say it's, it's a, a rope, uh, zero mass. A mass is all centered here, uh, infinitely strong, and um, length L. And uh, now you, you know, it, it has really only two, two degrees of freedom. The generalized coordinates that are very often used are a azimuthal angle, this angle here from the vertical to wherever that line is, and then the angle that will be the in the plane. That if you project that onto the plane, there would be an angle between some arbitrary axis here and the line from the origin of this coordinate frame. Uh, to where the projection onto that horizontal plane uh, lies, uh, the, this angle here. These are the two degrees of freedom. Uh, if you have a planar pendulum, right, that will be fixing this angle. It will be just in a plane, but a general, of course, it could be a, if it's, you know, a spherical joint here in a sensor, so the, the, the cable is fixed just in the vertical. I mean, it's actually, its position is fixed in 3D, and then it would be a spherical pendulum that has these two degrees of freedom. Even though as a rigid body, you know, this uh, mass would have six degrees of freedom. So that's the reduction. Now you can imagine if you, if you try to write down uh, Newton's law for that, it's, it's not, not entirely trivial to do all that right. And we can derive the equation most and very simply by just thinking of the energy. And that is something we can compute very easily. The easiest is perhaps the... Um, potential energy, which will be just a question of the elevation of that pendulum over some reference uh, plane. Now here, the reference plane would be typically uh, chosen as the one where, the, where the, in which the pendulum rests when it lies down. And you know, the, the uh, potential energy is, uh, has an arbitrary offset. You can always define where zero is. So you could take that to be up here at that fixture, I think, that is um, perhaps what was used here, right? Yeah, I think that's what was used here. Um, and then it's just a question of the you know, that distance here, and that distance is a function of the, the cosine of that function. So when that cosine is maximal, um, it would be fully extended, and then the pendulum will be hanging down 
you know, at an elevation that is the length of this cable L shifted from the top times mass times the gravitation constant, that would give you the potential energy uh, you have. That will be the minimal value when it's hanging down here. And any time you lift that higher, uh, you have more potential energy. So for instance, when this is horizontal, then this would be uh, zero. And so that's the potential energy. And the kinetic energy would be just um, the velocity of this point mass um, that would be sort of, you know, if this is a 3D derivative, it would be the length of that velocity vector squared. Uh, and this is the uh, ML squared, just the inertial moment of, of that, um, uh, that motion. And um, the, you know, you'd have to actually derive this concretely. I'm using polar coordinates here. That would be the connection between the 3D coordinate and the pendulum coordinates here, these generalized coordinates. And so you could figure that out that if you take the uh, r dot uh, uh, length squared, that it's this term which comes here from sinus squared plus cosine squared uh, is one, a couple of rules like that. Or you could just make it intuitive uh, if you could think of little velocity in this direction and what, what uh, kinetic energy that does and little velocity here in the horizontal direction where the effective length uh, is, is you know, modified uh, with this factor. And then you can perhaps see directly that that's the kinetic energy. So if you're a little bit practiced with this, oops, sorry, then you could actually directly write this down just from inspection. So once you've found these, no, so it's only knowing the kinetic energy and the potential energy as function of channelized coordinates, then you have the Lagrangian and now you can write down the equation, but just, mechanically going through these computations, right? You take uh, dl by d theta and then d by dt of that. So here you come up with a theta two dot and then dl by d theta, that's just the potential energy that depends on that. And you find th this expression and you combine all of those and uh, you end up with uh, this set of equations, not fairly complex, but you could, it's just straightforward derivation. So, you have uh, the acceleration in this uh, azimuthal angle, you know, is uh, multiplied here with the inertial moment and then has these, this contribution here. And in the other direction, you theta two dot, you know, you have this theta dependent, phi two dot, sorry, theta dependent term, and then uh, no, no gravitational term in that horizontal plane. And you have these, these mixed terms here. So if you analyze that more generally, the, the terms that are associated with the two dots with the accelerations in the generalized coordinates, they are called inertial terms. And this would be the generalized inertial moment of the system, it's a matrix. And then uh, all these mixed terms where theta and theta dot arise, these are called the, these are the um, uh, apparent forces, the centrifugal and Coriolis forces here, there isn't any. Um, and, uh, and then the, the term that depends only on theta, that is the gravitational term here, and here you can see it only shows up in the motion uh, that's connected to the elevations only in this direction that the potential energy changes and only therefore you only have in that direction you, you know gravitation accelerates around that axis not not around the horizontal motion so you could probably reproduce that if you just go through those equations yourself and it's in the in the textbook i have this from and uh, not this book from the other one the um, uh, the, the other one I said, I forgot the, the first author now. <clears throat> Here is an example closer to home, um, uh, a two link planar robot. So again, the Newtonian equations would be 12 equations and we have two generalized coordinates. And all we need to do is compute the kinetic energy of each segment, or ignoring the constraint, right? Just if it as a segment as such. Um, from these generalized coordinates. And then the same, uh, we, we need to do the same for the uh, potential energy. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, assuming here that the planar uh, robot would be in the horizontal plane. So the uh, potential doesn't change. That's different if it's vertical, but if it's in the horizontal plane, no, no gravitational change, and therefore there's no potential energy. So all I need is the kinetic energy. And um, 
you know, the kinetic um, energy is, uh, you know, for, for this segment would be just the uh, velocity of its center uh, of mass, x bar dot. Uh, so, so x1 uh, bar dot plus x2 bar dot is the velocity of the center of mass times the mass. And uh, this would be the rotational kinetic energy, which would be the inertial moment times the angular velocity dot squared, and the same for the second pendulum. And all you have to do now is uh, you know, compute these as a function of these angles. And that is just a question of uh, geometry. I'm, I haven't detailed that out, but you could imagine that you, you know, have x and y as a sinus and a cosinus of this. And uh, the, uh, it's you know, assumed sy symmetrical system, uh, homogeneous of the center of mass is really just it's uh, a halfway L1, L1 half will show up and so on. That, that, that's what result from this. You have to know the inertial moment of these masses. They are uh, approximated as, um, again, I, I would say homogeneous elements in 2D. So you can determine the uh, inertial moment from that. And the same for the second segment. And you end up with um, this kind of term where, you know, here's theta one, theta two dot squared. And these coefficients um, are not listed out here, but these are just, fun these is alpha band and so on are functions uh, parameters of, of the various uh, lengths, what mass, and so on coordinates. And um, it depends on the uh, sinuses and cosines of these two angles. So this is a notation you often find here that uh, S1 is short for sinus uh, of theta one, S2 of sinus theta two, and similar for uh, C. Uh, C1 is uh, cosine theta one, and C2 is cosine theta two. So, so here, in these C functions, there are these cosine sinus terms. So if you figure all of that out, you come up with this differential equation. Again, the inertial term uh, depends you know, on theta two, because you know, depending on, let's say if, if this is all the way uh, folded back, you have a smaller inertial moment than if it's extended, that's how you can see how this will depend on theta two. And then you have the centrifugal Coriolis force here, you can imagine that also depends on how extended the, jo the uh, joint is. If theta two is very extended, you'll have a larger inertial moment than if it's not. And um, no, no, again, no gravity because we're assuming it's horizontal. And then I'm writing down here these external generalized forces that would be torques if, if in terms of these uh, joint coordinates, these would be torques. Okay, so it's relatively simple to write down. If you go into these textbooks, you will see listings of these equations for uh, rather complex um, arms. And all of these can be very mechanically derived by just computing the energy of all the segments. Now imagine now you have a, a long kinematic chain in 3D um, with all you know, different geometries of how the joints uh, are connected. You don't have to take care of that. That's all in your kinematics. You just have to have the generalized coordinates write down the kinetic energy of each of these segments is always the same kind of mechanics. So all everything else just, uh, you know, kinematic constraints, but you don't have to think about any of those. And then uh, you just systematically make, you know, make the derivatives of the Lagrange equation in some of the software packages that are around for a robot arm dynamics. These are actually not ever multiplied out. You just have these modules which you multiply and which you also use in numerical simulation. So the equation is just implicit. The general form of these equations has is of, of open chain manipulator dynamics is, is this. So it always has this inertial term, the second derivative with a function, the inertial moment that depends on the joint configuration. Then it has this uh, term that's proportional to the um, derivative of the generalized coordinates that has generally position and velocity dependent coefficients in front of matrix in front, that's the centrifugal Coriolis forces. And then you have the gravitational torque, which uh, doesn't really, uh, would be under, under other circumstances when you, actually not for, for um, revolute joints, would not depend on theta dots, but there are other actuators where it can depend on theta dot. And then the forcing function would be the active torques that your manipulator generates. Now, that's the general form that from now on I will be using as a reference. Okay, so that much about the mechanics, of course, in reality, you know, there's more stuff you have to think about, like 
kind of exchange that converge and you know, there's some additional stuff like you have legged robots, you can imagine you have differences between contact points. So there's more to that, but roughly speaking, that's sort of the idea. That's why open chain is sort of simpler than closed chain. Now, um, control. So robot uh, motion is, is a, an example of control. And I'm just first introducing very generally the notion of control and there are different ways of how to frame that. This is, so this is a very general diagram from the textbook on, on control that is, uh, illustrates the notion of feed forward control and feedback control. Feed forward control would be that you have, first of all, you have a, uh, a plant, you know, the thing that you want to control. And on that plant, you have particular things that can act on the plant. Uh, so in the robot case, it would be the robot motors, or um, you know, in general, it would be in some, for instance, if you think of a car, it would be your, your, maybe your gas throttle or your steering wheel or something like that. And the, the outcome of that is then uh, you know, the state of that system that you consider the output. That, that's the thing that you want to control. Um, the, the way you deal with the actuators is that you give a signal to those that uh, you know, make the physical effects. So for instance, a lot of examples, it would be an electric motor and the signal would be some voltage or some current that you're sending to the motor. Um, and so when you have feed forward control, that would mean that you have some desired uh, time course of whatever it is that you want to generate. You put that in and you have uh, some way of computing the signal that you give to the um, you know, the controller that you know, generates the physical forces in the actuator that makes the plant do whatever you want. So you have to have a good model of this whole chain to know what sort of thing to put in here to get something out. It, that will be open loop control. That is something I will have an example later. Um, is used uh, and that's useful, especially when your process itself has some stability properties of, for instance, damping that would make um, that the, it doesn't catastrophically deviate from anything desired. Feedback control means that you're adding stability by uh, observing some variables at the output level uh, through some sensors that have their own properties. And then you can insert a signal from these sensors. The general notion is that you would estimate from sensor signals whether the output is equal to the desired output and that comparison gives you an error message and that you would send uh, signals to the controller that uh, work in the direction of reducing the error and then over time this might converge so that's the general notion of feedback control so more concretely mathematically uh, how people write that down is that they introduce um, a vector of uh, variables that describe the system that description would typically in include the actuator. Um, so in some cases, it would also include the controller. For instance, if you have an electrical circuit that drives a motor that makes a torque, so you might need to include in the model, the a model of the motor and maybe even of the electronics. I'll give you examples for that. In more general cases, we will lump all of that into some term in the equation and then actually no longer just keep track of the inner state of electrical circuit and of the motor. And you can imagine that's a question in the nervous system, right? What, what is the, the plant really? Is the muscle part of the plant or is it part of the control? And you have a, a output variable Y that would be the variable that uh, you are interested in controlling. That in robotics is um, sometimes not qualitatively the same variable. So sometimes it is, let's say you, your axes are joint angles and you want to achieve particular state of the joint angles, then the output would perhaps also be a joint angle. So on the only difference between that output variable and the uh, variable, uh, and state variable would be some, uh, for instance, some estimation process. And so we're actually distinguishing between the output itself and the estimate of the output. I'm not detailing that, but there's a whole field of how to make such estimates. Um, but in other cases, you might actually want to control, for instance, hand in space. So you control where the gripper is, 
while the kinds of state variables that describe, uh, you know, that your actor adders are connected to are joint angles. And so there could be a real difference between the state variables and what you consider the output. And then the other thing is that there is an, a control signal. The control signal will, will in, in different cases, will write down that could be some external time course that you have figured out that in, you insert that time course into which generate ultimately active torques in the system to achieve a particular trajectory that will be open loop control, or you make that control signal a function. I have a slide here, I think, from that. Make that a function of, um, of the, uh, the state that you measure and of the desired state that you have. Uh, in which you, uh, you know, which you derive as a control law. So, so, so you post a function and see proof that it does achieve that. That is, that with that function, given that function, the solutions of these dynamic systems are such that the um, Y approximates this desired response in some sense, converges over time to the desired response. And so the mathematical theory of control is all about that, about proving stability. So that's where attractive stuff happens. For instance, in, you're just controlling a single state, then you would have the, the, the notion that the difference between uh, the, the realized state and the desired state um, converges to zero over time. You could be tracking such response. That is, if this changes in time slowly, then you would be tracking that attractor, and, and therefore Y would always approximate that. Uh, you could have um, stochastic. Uh, so, so you could have optimal control. So optimal control would be that you have a desired change of the state at a certain time, and you derive a whole function u uh, that takes you there. Like for instance, you have a train, you want to stop the train in the station at a particular position, and you might derive some way of, you know, the time course of how hard you should break so that you stop there. That might be not trivial, might re re require you to know how inner, what the inertial moment of the train is, which might mean that you need to know how many people are on the train. Um, and you could have so-called stochastic optimal control or, or actually optimal feedback control where you would um, include in this uh, control law some dependence on the estimated state uh, or estimated output and, um, and you know, determine the optimal parameter values uh, for that control law that uh, make that you're converging to the desired response uh, that way. And I was go going to go into the details of that, that uh, is a somewhat advanced phase, a whole lecture course really about that. Just I'm just sort of pointing to that. So that's the, the very general framework. When you apply that uh, to robotics um, in actual technical fact, you have to deal with this inner stuff, which in the kind of laws that people talk about is always tucked away because we're assuming that that's all solved. And it's all solved in the sense that the, the robots that you buy have motors and electronics that control the motors and they are designed in a certain way so that in effect, you only need to know what kind of control variables you, you want to achieve, for instance, uh, positions, uh, joint velocities, and perhaps sometimes you can, um, specified torques, even though there is no feedback control of, of torque in these com commercial arms. And so you, you package all of that away. But I first wanted to illustrate, uh, following this textbook, illustrate that there is inside, of course, also control like that, control in which you have to send some voltage you know, to the motors and you have to adjust these voltages so that the motors really do what, you're, what they're supposed to do. So in, in this conception, this here is the model of the arms dynamics. So this would be the actual arm in the control system. And if you simulate that, you would put, put the equation of motion of the actual arm in here. Um, the desired behavior would be typically some kinematic plan. So you get the timing signal from the, what we talked about last week and the week before, a time course of joint angles or of the end effector um, uh, time course. Uh, would come in here. Um, you would, the controller would be either this open loop function or something that depends on estimates of the uh, arms um, states. 
and then uh, the controller computes from that something that you send to this ensemble here. And so I'll, I'll have a little quick little look in, inside that ensemble, but just very briefly. So here's a, a general picture of what that entails. So somewhere in there, you have um, the actual motors, and these motors take um, some uh, current, right, electrical current. And when there is a well-defined current, um, they, under certain circumstances, will create a certain amount of movement that can be either assessed through the position, through velocity, or, or uh, through torque. Torque is very hard to measure, so it's not typically part of the feedback loop. Uh, you would have a, um, uh, a very good sensor for these mechanical con conditions. For instance, the standard procedure is you have a so-called shaft encoder, so some mechanism of how you uh, determine how strongly the uh, axis which rotates within the motor has moved. I have some calibration, and so you know its position once you know that, like, for instance, in discrete steps. So that would allow you to create a position feedback. But you have another internal feedback loop in which the motor will you know, generate a position change and so on, but um, how much it changes, uh, it does that, depends on how much resistance it encounters. And uh, you can uh, reduce this dependence by ramping up or down your current depending on that. And so uh, what, what it is another little feedback loop in here in that you have a, a electrical circuit that measures how much current actually is consumed by the motor. And you compare that to the current that you're trying to impose and you're trying to impose that current based on theoretical models that you have of this motor to, to say, if I want to uh, create this much torque uh, this much current should do it. And by having this little feedback loop that controls the current, uh, you can um, approximate better the um, dynamics that this motor will bring about um, than if you didn't do that, right? If you had just an open loop uh, kind of uh, electrical circuit. So this inner feedback loop where the current is stabilized is something that we usually don't really talk about. That's something that uh, the co companies uh, solve for us. And uh, it's a little bit of a problem for academic work because the robot arms that you buy all have control um, systems here at this level, which are not always actually transparent. They are not uh, telling you what the equations are or what the algorithm is for that. And so you're just creating this whole thing as, as one system. And that's what we'll also do for the rest of ours. And, and when uh, some of the models that we're using, they say you give a um, torque command, that is you can tell the motor to make a certain uh, level of torque. And a lot of the control schemes I will be talking about say, um, you know, I, I compute the torque that I want to send to the motors. But to the motor, you're really sending a um, electrical command, right? And uh, the, the notion is that by setting up uh, this internal system, you can approximate uh, that torque relatively well. That is, you can arrange that these motors will approximately generate the torque that you're commanding. That's how we can talk like that. It's not a guarantee in the sense that if there are deviations from that torque, because there are you know, unmodeled perturbations on that system, then these torques, there is nothing that corrects these torques. Now, you, you, you only correct for position and velocity feedback, for instance, but you're not uh, correcting for deviations from the torque. Because to do that, you would have to measure torque. And measuring torque is hard, as I said before. Measuring torque requires essentially little springs where you uh, extend the spring while you're moving. And uh, doing that during movement is, is difficult. And generally, when you have springs like that, then the arm is no longer really stiff, and that causes problems. So. There are um, pretty much no commercial robot arms that control torque in the sense of feedback control of making sure the uh, torque that is measured actually matches the torque that you're uh, intending. Um, there is one commercial arm like that. That's uh, uh, the lightweight robotic arm that we're using uh, in our lab. And that is um, largely a uh, experimental platform that's used by research groups to do this sort of work. Um, 
maybe it is being used already in some industry context, but I'm not, not actually even aware of anyone doing that. There's been a lot of research in robotics about that. Um, for instance, controlling torque is really important when you do uh, abrasive tasks, when you're applying a robot to, um, you know, for instance, uh, transform material like in drilling or in, in uh, uh, milling. And that is something that um, doesn't work very well. And, and this is a topic of research. It's, it's just, it turns out to be quite difficult. So when you see torque commands being mentioned in the control schemes I'll be talking about, it's always in that sense of this um, uh, really this current that you're giving to the controller and the electronics of that make sure that that the motor is going to approximately compute something like uh, generate that kind of torque um, because of its electronic um, feedback loop but it isn't actually feedback controlling the torque itself okay good so that's the way of how uh, that's how the um, uh, robotic control is framed uh, in all robotic control schemata of classical robots, it's always that the uh, the control signal that is being sent down here are considered really torques on the arms. So it's collapsing the whole problem that I'm talking about in defining this interface that whatever you're sending here is a torque and this uh, electronic control circuit is of assumed given. Good. So um, I well, can say robotic control consists of devising control laws. That is, these kind of dependencies of of how the U depends on the desired trajectory and the current state, or some estimate of it, um, that leads to stable control. And uh, in in practice, then these control laws that I'll I'll be showing you a few examples. I'll, I'll not really derive them or, or explain them in a lot of detail. Um, so it's the idea that in practice, they are numerically computed on a microprocessor or a computer that's connected to the robot arm. And then uh, from that numerical simulation, time courses of these control variables U are sent to the you know, hardware controller that's on the robot arm that then will bring about those torques, those, those desired torques, right? So this, this part here where this controller sends, that's the part that is numerically simulated um, in a way that is funds could be even on a digital computer if you control that from the outside or sometimes on an embedded piece of computation for autonomous robots. Okay, so uh, now some of you may, may actually know control theory a little bit, uh, but some not, so uh, a little bit in, in a bind as usual. So I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of intuition for what that entails without really being totally you know, proving anything or, or being very rigorous about it. So um, let's say you want to generate a, a particular desired um, joint motion. Um, and, and to do that, you have to generate, you know, give these control signals, which we'll now think of desired torques for the joints that make that your uh, joint angle approximates this and we can talk about that as some error signal which would be the real joint trajectory minus this desired one for that to be small so here's an example where you're saying i have maybe a desired a torque state which would be zero here and i have some initial state and uh, when i have a particular control system in place it will generate time courses of the real robot arm that make that the error overall maybe become smaller than it initially is. It might have a couple of problems. Namely, it would, for instance, have oscillations. They call it, talk about overshoot, so it would be, go further than desired and then return and so on. There is something called your settling time, that is uh, the time needed to approximate the desired state um, within a certain criterion level. And there could be a remaining error, an, an error that is not reduced to zero. And I'll talk about these different aspects in a moment. They depend on different aspects of the control law. That is true for every controller. These are never zero. Uh, there is, um, the settling time is never you know, infinitely short or I mean zero. Uh, the terminal error is never, never exactly zero. It's just some small number, hopefully. And there can be overshoot, there can be oscillations. You can also have critically damped 
a controller that doesn't overshoot, but then it's typically somewhat slow. The settling time comes becomes longer if you avoid overshoot. So typically you tolerating some overshoot. It depends actually on um, on certain parameters of, of whether it occurs or not. The characterization of these uh, different control behaviors is in terms of the eigenvalues of the dynamic system that the controller plus the physics of the control plant erects. So um, control theory, these are often complex equations, but you can linearize them around the uh, desired state. This is all around a, a desired fixed state, so a fixed point attractor. And the, it becomes an attractor through the control scheme. And therefore, you can use the, the kind of attractor dynamics that you're familiar with. And the effective description is then in terms of the eigenvalue. So the imaginary part of the eigenvalue has to be negative for this to be a stable state. The imaginary part is going to determine the overshoot. So the, the further along this axis you are, the more oscillations you'll have. Um, and uh, again, the further from the imaginary axis you are, the more um, uh, you know, the, the, the faster the, the damping, the, the, the faster the, uh, the shorter the settling time, as they say here. The relaxation time would be the mathematical concept, and the settling time, some kind of empirical estimate of it. Yeah, and if you are in the right half, you have an unstable controller that will not reduce the R to zero, right? So the mathematics of these controllers, again, which include the control law and the physical plant is really sort of like the dynamics that we postulated, but we didn't use them for control, right? We use them to create desired trajectories as, a, as possible solutions. But it's the same mathematical principle. Let's make the attractive dynamics uh, approach attractive because we're using at the level of planning, in fact, also at the level of timing with limit cycle oscillators, which also have stability properties, and then a level of control, the same mathematics. So when you couple everything, then you, uh, you know, they all work with each other because they're all just coupled stable dynamical systems. Ideally. So here to give you a toy example. And you could have a mass that you uh, that is somehow connected to to ground by a spring and a damper, and you apply an external force to that. So this would be the equation of the mass itself. And then the external force, do I have an equation for that? I think in a moment. Uh, no, so that's all I have for this example. Uh, so that would your controller would apply some external force to you know arrange that the position of the spring is is a desired position. Just use this example to say you know that the uh, these properties of this plant would you know affect control, and that's, this is particularly important in uh, human motion and and. Uh, and Li Zhang will be talking about this next week, that um, properties of the plant, you know, of the control system itself, um, may include such things. So it's not just rigid body. It could be really um, the properties of, the passive properties of muscles, for instance, can uh, make that they are elastic and viscous elements that sort of contribute to control. For instance, the viscous element will make stability because it will make zero velocity a stable state. Uh, and they can contrib uh, contribute to the, to the control dynamics. In um, industrial robotics, it's often an effort to minimize that influence of the plant, to make sure that it's as frictionless as possible, so that all the friction is friction that you put in by making the control force proportional to the rate of change, and you can control the effective damping of the system. Right? If not, there will be a plant contribution to the damping of the system. In the um, nervous system, so it's almost the opposite. That is, you're using passive properties of your, um, you know, of your um, physiology to achieve some of the control. So, for instance, uh, uh, something that you do in human motor control is that you're uh, varying stiffness. And there's some technical um, uh, some inspiration for technical systems to do that. So, uh, you can think of your muscles as uh, springs and, and they only pull in one direction and then you have uh, muscles that co counteract co-contraction uh, so so that you, you know you contract your biceps and your triceps and stiffen the joints so you can vary the stiffness by an active 
uh, command and therefore you can configure your plant so that it is uh, you, know, you know goes from oscillatory to critically damped or not um, so that the same controller will have a different effect just on how you configure your plant so in the nervous system the, the, these are tightly uh, connected while in uh, tech and control systems they try to um, have a fixed model of the plant and be, have that have modeled all the influence that it has on control. Good. Uh, just one point here. So, so also a toy example. If you were to control a single joint, so you have a, a this little stick here, let's say that has a hinge joint here, and have an actuator on that hinge joint, and um, and it's not in the center of mass, so there's, there will be some gravitational force. So if this was free, right, this pendulum would just fall down because it's where the center of mass is, and this is where it's connected, so it would fall down. And so with this torque motor, you want to you know, put it in a particular position, as a toy example. So the Lagrange equation of this thing will uh, be this one. Here's the inertial term. This is a, the gravitational term, and this is part of the uh, centrifugal force. and um, and so, and you, you can actuate that. You can put some torque on, on this. And uh, you know, one way to do that is to insert a torque here that is zero when something desired happens. And that desired could mean that your joint angle error, this theta would be the difference between the desired and the real joint angle. Joint angle error velocity you know, the, with the derivative. And this is an integral term I'll come to. So that will be uh, integrating, um, actually should, should have an E here, the joint error, I believe. Um, yeah, should be integrated, uh, missing an E here. Is this an equation I have? No, this I just copied, so it must be some mistake in the, the book. Um, sorry, here. Uh, so, so that's what you would insert here. So, if all these errors are zero, then you would have zero torque. And, um, and so what you want is to define this here uh, so that uh, this will be zero when theta equals some desired value. So here's a desired value, theta is fed back and the error would be zero when theta equals the desired value. And if you arrange this for it to be that case, so for instance, for these first two, two terms, they would be zero when theta error is zero, when theta equals theta delta, then you would have a perfect uh, solution. Um, so here. So th this is called a PID controller in the sense, this is a proportional control signal, proportional to the error. This is a D differential controller, and this is an integral controller. Let's first think about the first two terms. So whenever, you know, the first two terms would make that um, when you're settling, uh, the velocity will go to zero once you're settled. So this uh, D term goes to zero. The, the P term would settle when it's minimal. Now here, they will, it will not go to zero because the gravitational force will pull the joints down and therefore, uh, the, you, you, know, you will not, um, uh, even if you've come to a rest, uh, the torque needed so that you know, this will be zero and this will be zero in the, uh, once the velocity term has gone to zero. So you will have a torque that is non-zero because there will be this gravitational torque here on this. And what the integral term does, it, it ramps up the torque until you exactly cancel this term. So with the integral term, uh, the, um, the configuration that you achieve will actually achieve the design, the error will really go to zero, really achieve the desired uh, term. Uh, so the integral term is sort of to correct anything that uh, isn't, um, you know, that where, where exact control isn't um, guaranteed. Uh, the integral term is actually uh, quite problematic if you uh, have a mistake in your model, uh, for instance, uh, let's say the pendulum is prevented from reaching that desired position because it, it, connect, it, it touches the table, let's say, then the integral term will keep ramping up the torque to overcome that error uh, until you maybe you, you know, break the table or, or the motor breaks. Um, and and that, that's why, it, it, it can cause problems. It's, it's a famous, famously uh, 
problematic term. So the PD controller is the solid thing that uh, doesn't introduce additional variables, but it cannot compensate for external forces that require a previously uncomputed um, control signal. Um, let's, let's think through, so this is a feedback controller, right? This is where the control signal you in, inject here depends on the measured uh, actual joint trajectory through the error terms or through this integral term. Uh, a feedforward controller would be one where you compute the torque um, that is needed. That is, you, you say, if I have a desired trajectory, can I actually just insert here a time course of torque that will make sure that the system actually does something desired? So, for instance, if you were to in inject this uh, torque, where uh, inside the, the M tilde and H tilde mean that you're injecting here the um, desired trajectory into the equation. And, and that will be the time course you put in here. And the notion would be if you insert that here uh, and you look at all the terms, let's say on the right hand side, you, so you would have this here is equal to that. And you could see if the model is correct, then you would uh, get that the theta will be approximately equal to the theta dot because the same terms on the left and the right, right? If you uh, take all the, you know, uh, close to this, all of these terms will cancel and there will be essentially theta two dot equals theta two dot desired. And that will have the solution that theta is equal to theta desired all the time. Um, so that will work to some extent. So here's an example of, of this system achieving a particular state that way by, in, by injecting the torque, you see that the, it, it can approximate that well. But if you are, sorry, but if you have a small deviation in the model, so it's not exactly sure what that was. So if the model isn't quite perfect, the, uh, there can be quite a discrepancy between the desired and the actual state. And this will be here around an unstable state where that tends to amplify such differences. And um, in a feedforward control, there is, of course, no countermeasure, right? Because it just puts that computed um, signal onto the uh, plant. And if there's any deviation, there is no way of how the system uh, compensates for that deviation. So feedforward control no, cannot compensate for disturbances, right? And that's the limitation of that. Still, feedforward control can do a lot. And the best idea is to combine feedforward control with feedback control. So, for instance, one way to do that is to say, uh, in this uh, feedforward control scheme, remember that I, I inject a torque that is proportional to the modeled inertia and has the modeled um, uh, Coriolis and, and centrifugal forces uh, in here to compensate for the ones that really occur. But the desired um, acceleration is substituted by desired um, consideration plus a control signal. So this will be something that will uh, change the torque in the direction of reducing the distance between the desired and the real um, control, uh, the real state. Uh, this is sometimes called computed, computed torque uh, controller or Writing it in this form is sometimes called inverse dynamics. Inverse dynamics is a little bit misleading sometimes because you might think it is inverting the equation for the dynamics, but it actually really means you have a model of the dynamic and you make it inverse in the sense of injecting into the equation of motion that model, right? And here, what you're doing, this is your model. So equals, this is your model. And inverse dynamics consists of saying that I'm using that model to predict the kinds of um, uh, you know, to compensate for these terms by predicting what these terms would be if you send that controller down there. That's what you're doing here. And in practice, that is a problem of real-time computation because these models can be quite complex. So, so these equations can be vector-valued equations with a lot, a lot of terms. You know, imagine these 3D uh, kinematic equations, you have all these different rotation matrices you know, have to multiply. And you do that now for these complex terms here. There's a lot of matrix, matrix multiplication you have to do in real time uh, with very good precision. Um, and that is actually a bottleneck for some of these controls. In history, it's certainly been now with computation, 
distributed computation, embedded computation being very good, it's, it's getting better. Um, okay, so that was the uh, this notion of computer torque control. Um, what's so so this was all this toy example, right? A single joint being controlled this way. It's all this joint example here. So when I now uh, do this for the multi joint arm, uh, different ways of how one can do that. So the naive or, or direct way is to control every joint independently. And that is the state of the art for almost all uh, industry robots. So in, in the industry robots, you use a, a true a PD controller that is here, see, see this depends on just the error signal. Um, so you have the, uh, it's actually PID control. Um, so you, that's the torque you inject and that is for every joint. So there's no coupling between joints for every joint you just compute the error at the joint, the error and the velocity and the error, the integrated error. And um, you inject that for every joint and therefore control them independently. And um, even though the joints of course are coupled through the inertial torques, right? This is this notion, I think I've said that before that if you're, uh, uh, for instance, if you want to control your wrist and your elbow as a human, uh, you in inject some torque at the, elbow the uh, say accelerating the joint this direction your wrist you know it will uh, create acceleration at the wrist and your wrist will uh, experience a torque right it's called the interaction torque right if i if i keep the wrist uh, loose you can sort of see that if i accelerate around the elbow you know this flapping motion of the wrist reflects that there are torques that act on the wrist and that come from the torque I injected at the elbow, into action torques, right? And when we actually do that, when I oscillate my wrist, uh, my, my elbow and keep the stiff, I'm actually compensating for that. I'm, I'm, you can really measure that uh, when you look at the muscles, that I'm, I'm in anticipation of the torque that will act on the wrist. I'm already firing the corresponding muscle a little earlier to make this, um, uh, make it possible to keep the wrist constant. Uh, so this simple control scheme that is used in most industrial robots does not do that. It just measures any deviation that occurs at some other joint as a result of all the action you're doing somewhere else. And each of these joints independently tries to minimize that. Um, that is really the reason why these uh, robot arms are so much stronger than their payload. Uh, because they have to be able to create a lot of torques that are just for compensating for these interactions. So these are not yet torques that are available to lift a heavy, heavy load. If you lift a heavy load and there are uh, perturbations like that from the very different joints, then you wouldn't have any torque left in your motors to compensate for that. So you have to make them much stronger than the uh, maximal uh, torque they need for, for their payload. So it's a little bit of a vicious circle because a, a longer can exchange, you have more and more interaction torques, you need longer, more and more strong joints. And because you have very strong, uh, strong motors, and because strong motors cre create strong accelerations, they also can create a lot of interaction torques. And you have you now, you can see how that becomes a little nonlinear uh, problem. But it's still very effective and um, that and simple. And that is pretty good. We have very good torque controllers, uh, joint controllers that, um, PID controllers that do this quite well. <clears throat> now, more sophisticated schemes do include some of that compensation. So, so he, here's an idea, you know, rather than inject here, this torque to be just some con feedback control signal, like this would be a PID controller. I'm actually also including here this predicted um, inverse dynamics, right? So I'm, I'm saying with my desired trajectory, uh, maybe some estimate of uh, my current velocity, I'm adding terms here and generating uh, torques that mirror some of the stuff on the other, on the left-hand side and therefore cancel that, right? If, if you were able to inject exactly this term, you know, it, it would, you, you could extract the M here to the left side. Let's say this one would exactly cancel this one. This one would exactly cancel that one. So here on the left, you will be left with M of theta times theta two dot minus theta desired here. And on the right-hand side, you would actually also weigh your control signal with this inertial moment. And you can you know, divide by that. And then 
you would just have this error signal. So this is a perfect, just for the error signal, a perfect uh, harmonic oscillator point attractor, right? It would, with a certain maybe overshoot, undershoot kind of uh, oscill oscillatory relaxation. And that would make perfect tracking for your signal, right? So that's um, using inverse dynamics that, that way. This is a uh, form that is used in some robot arms, uh, high performance robot arms. It's famously used in things like the space shuttle robot arm that um, wants to minimize the total level of torques that you apply to the uh, to the joints because uh, in you know in a space uh, in space robotics you cannot have these large torques that flow into the uh, Earth that the you know arm is connected to because this whole spaceship will start to wobble if you uh, generate these very large torques. And so they uh, optimized everything. And that, that's one of the famous uses of these very complicated uh, control schemes. I believe that there are other robot arms that do that. I don't know how prevalent they are in industrial practice, but they are certainly uh, exist in robotic labs. There's a lot of work uh, around that. It's a very, very well developed field. Um, So uh, there is uh, so one one scheme is that you do that only with only for gravity compensation uh, to make it simpler because the uh, computer torque is actually um, not always possible to do in real time. Good. Um, I already hinted that uh, this whole field. So, so the last minute, I'll just point at problems. This whole field um, works well as long as you're not doing something mechanical with that arm. So for instance, a lot of industry robots are just pointing at stuff and they spray paint or they uh, you know, just uh, move some measurement device and so on. Uh, even uh, if you do welding, you know, a lot of that welding doesn't require, uh, it just requires you to position yourself close and then the welding tool does something, it's creating some heat. And it does not do some, anything abrasive, right? Where you actually have to make contact and maybe transmit a certain amount of force. That, that's called um, compliance. That is um, resisting contact to a well-defined degree. And that is a complicated problem that uh, requires you really to measure these forces or torques that uh, occur. And that's difficult in general. Um, the notion of impedance control uh, comes from that. And that is something that humans are supposed to always to be able to do and always do. So impedance control means that you're not just controlling uh, a one particular state, one particular position velocity of your end effect, let's say, but you're actually control, uh, arranging that it's a whole function that is how that position will depend on some external force or acceleration. So you could think of that as, as being sort of a, um, a mass spring system. That is your, that your end effector has a certain uh, characteristic way how it will shift when you apply an external force with respect to both the uh, deviation from its current state and the, uh, the deviation in velocity from zero. And this, so it will not resist, you know, just make that back to zero, but in a characteristic way that you can really determine this stiffness and this viscosity. Uh, the most famous use of that in robotics is um, in teleoperation. When you control an arm at a distance, again, famously, of course, in space, uh, space scenario, but also let's say in nuclear power plant where you're not really there. And um, when you do that, you might interact with uh, objects and so on, and, and you might want to, uh, make sure that the robot arm doesn't just kinematically realize your trajectory, but actually reacts to contact in a defined way. Let's say you want to grasp with the robot arm some flask and then you know, maybe do some operation like in a chemical lab. And you, uh, you know, in order for the arm to grasp the flask, it has to make a certain amount of force, not too much, not too little on that flask so that it will not drop out of the gripper. And you maybe you could know before and how strongly you can push and that can be characterized by an effective stiffness. And you wanna make sure that the controller actually does that, that, that kind of stiffness. And the uh, high point of that is if the human operator who does that gets some feedback about the force that's currently being uh, 
uh, generated and thus also the the uh, uh, user mirrors the, the the user interface mirrors the uh, robot and gives the user some feedback about the current stiffness and viscosity that the robot realizes so that you feel that you're pressing against the uh, surface and then you can really operate well so there are uh, solutions to that especially in these kind of scenarios and there's a lot of theory around that and humans are famously very good at doing these kinds of things uh, um, you know at for instance grasping a, an egg differently than i don't know football or you know being adjusting stiffness and viscosity kind of uh, constraints for to the task uh, so much so that, uh, I don't know if you know, that there are some applications where humans are just used to guide a robot to uh, deal with the compliance. And the most famous example was catching satellites. Uh, you, know, you might know that these robots' arm, arms on the space shuttle were supposed to catch a satellite you know, to, for repair, and that was actually achieved uh, several times. It was kind of a routine operation. But the original scheme of really doing that by the arm itself didn't work out because the it was so difficult to control that interaction on contact um, that it wasn't viable. And what ended up be the solution is that the, the human astronaut would uh, you know connect himself to the arm you know with some uh, holders for the boots and would actually catch the satellite by hand and wiggle the satellite into the mechanism that would snap uh, you know, lock on, on onto the satellite. So we were using the fact that they had very good compliant control. You can imagine if you're doing this too stiff, the satellite will sort of spill off and the, the, the whole spaceship could again be wobbling. If you do it too slowly, you would get into some instability and not really be able to uh, make contact as well. So you have to do it just right. And that was something that humans can actually learn to do quite well. So it's an interesting research field to um, realize impedance control uh, in robot arms and connect them to uh, humans. And the last point I want to make is that there is a well-established mathematical framework of how to connect the control at the joint level to this kind of control at the end effector level, because you know the impedance demands are typically in terms of the tools. You now you want to let's say, for instance, you're you're, you use a screwdriver on a part and you hold the part and you want that system to resist in a well-defined way to any forces that you exert on it as you, you know, undo, let's say, a rusty screw. Um, and so that's something that happens in the end effects of scale space because you, you have a, the position of the screwdriver relative to the object, for instance, that's what you want to control. And you want stiffness in that space and you're bringing that about with something along your robotic arm, right? Where you're controlling you know, muscles or torque motors. And so what you need to do is uh, you need to uh, connect the robot dynamics, the robot arm dynamics with joint torques to the end effector dynamics. So some uh, dynamical Euler Lagrange equation in end effector space. This is called the operational space formulation, Katip, the same Katip who invented the potential field approach. Um, provide a very general framework of how to connect these two, some very general uh, invariants, and, and that's sort of routinely done these days, uh, this computing the dynamics in either space. And you can see that for redundant systems where they don't have the same dimensionality, there's some special stuff to solve, but, but that's fairly well understood. Good. Good. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much done with this. I just want to highlight again that um, in this control scheme, there are the ultimately is in this robotic scheme of control, it's always the, you know, the, the plan is the desired trajectory, right? Joint trajectory or, or joint velocity trajectory or whatever it is. It might you know, be a plan that is first in uh, end effector coordinates, you translate it into joint coordinates as kinematics, inverse kinematics and so on, as we've talked about before. Um, and, 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 and so motion planning and control are really separate in this system. So uh, the, this kinematic inverse kinematics, no, um, I would say there are standard solutions to that, but, but that's sort of the classical picture. It's just a little less clear how that would uh, work in human motor arms. And, and, and in fact, I don't think one can say that separation is true in 
two motor arms. Let's skip this here um, and also maybe that. And so I'll just point to uh, next week when um, Lee will talk about these sort of things in human motion. He will not talk about biomechanics as much as the biomechanics is essentially the rigid body motion scheme for skeletons and so on. And so there is nothing mm, special about that, except you know, these are not cylinders. You have to do some more effort to really figure out what the equations are to characterize exactly the joints and so on. So it's all discipline how to do that well. There's also the, the problem that uh, there is flesh <laughs> attached to bones. And so there is viscosity and elasticity just from that. You know, meat itself is also uh, viscous and elastic. So you have some contributions and Lee will point out that briefly. Uh, but, but he will really talk about the actors. So the, these are muscles are not motors, so they're not, uh, can't be catalyzed by just sending a desired torque into them. This whole electronic tuning, that that's a good product and it doesn't work. And so there's a question of how, how that really works. And we'll be talking about that a little bit. Okay, with that, I close this lecture.